Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2017. Featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family. And featured speaker, John Bradshaw. All to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. Welcome back to a 3ABN Fall Camp Meeting camp meeting right here at the 3 ABM Worship Center. And uh, we got a good crowd here tonight. Y'all happy in the Lord? Yeah. All right. It really is. I want to tell you something. I travel to churches, but you never see so many friendly, happy faces as we do here at 3 ABN camp meeting. And that's because y'all travel long distances. It says you want to be here, right? Sometimes in church, you can see the husband going to sleep and the wife's poking him a little bit. And it's like, I think he'd rather be home, but he knows it'd be miserable later on if he doesn't go to church with her, you know, <laughs> things like that. That goes through my mind. I know it shouldn't all the time when I'm up front speaking. I'm like, oh, I think this person would rather be home. But anyway, not here at 3 ABN camp meeting. Y'all are happy. You have happy faces and you're happy in the Lord. We ought to be the happiest, most excited people on planet Earth. Can you imagine that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, you and I were on his mind? We were on his mind. And he could look down that stream of time and see a people that would be willing to give their lives unto death, if necessary, for the cause of God. It's an honor to be living in the closing moments of earth's history and be a part of a, a movement, a church, but a movement that has present truth to give to a lost and dying world. Be living right in the time that Jesus is about to come back. I'm excited tonight about the Lord, but I'm excited about 3 ABN camp meeting. I'm excited about salvation. It's a free gift that's offered to us. And I'm so thankful tonight that we have uh, Brother John Bradshaw. He's speaker, director. It is written. I've known John for many, many years. What you see is what you get. Amen. And he's not a person that worries about political correctness. Somebody say amen. amen. So tonight, some of you remember, remember that if he steps on your toes tonight, right? <laughs> Because you said you didn't mind him uh, being uh, not worrying about political correctness. He really doesn't, but he's led by the Holy Spirit, a great anointing on him. Uh, but before he comes to uh, speak to us tonight, it's my privilege to have my daughter Melody and uh, Melody Dawn. And I'm going to ask her to come out and sing. She, she uh, took the husband and kids a few years ago and deserted me and went to Nashville. And so now... I know at least at camp meetings I get to see him, so the, the, the airport's a little farther to Nashville for us to drive, maybe 30, 45 minutes longer, but I go there instead of St. Louis when I can, because guess what? Get to see my grandbabies, right? And you, of course, too, Melody. <laughs> I love you, and I'm so glad you're here. What are you going to sing for us tonight? Let it fall, but i got to tell you, I'm a little concerned. Because Molly told me she was going to heckle me the whole time I was saying. She was going to heckle yes. you? Molly wouldn't do so that. So I'm no. not going to be able to look over there. Okay, so. don't look over there. <laughs> Molly, Sue. If I forget the words, y'all will know why. <laughs> <laughs> You'll do great. Melody, when she was born, we named her Melody in faith. God would give her musical abilities. And we dedicated her to the Lord. And we said, Lord, if you give this uh, child, we're, we're asking you give this child a gift of music. That's why we named her Melody Dawn, the dawn of new, new music in the family. And uh, we said we'll raise her in an atmosphere free of other type of music. And we, we did that, and God is blessed. And uh, so I love to hear you sing. I'm sure I'm not prejudiced. But uh, I love you and love your heart and love the whole family. So glad Thank you're here you tonight, baby. You. situations like I've never seen leaves my heart uncertain of what tomorrow may bring it seems I could lose all that I've gained if everything falls Lord I just pray According to 
pursue your purpose for the rest of my days. Let it fall. Let it fall into place. The more things slip away, the more I try to hold on. My grip is getting weak. Lord, my hands aren't that strong. But I know I can trust your will and your way. So if everything falls, Lord, I just pray. Let it fall into place. For the rest of my days, let it fall, let it fall into place. Your words for the universe, your breath gave me life, your thoughts are on my future. Beautiful. Good evening, everyone. So good to see you tonight. I'm glad you are here. Are you glad you're here? Yeah, you should be. You're in the right place this weekend. And wherever you're joining us from, thanks for being part of this camp meeting experience. Uh, to be here on site is to be blessed. What do you say? It's to be really blessed. And uh, we've still got a whole 24-hour-plus period left to go. So I'm just really glad. Now, I'm going to let you know something that we got, we're bringing to you on, it is on, on, on 3ABN from It Is Written at the end of October. You know that the 31st of October marks 500 years since the Reformation was kicked off. Not that you can really tie it to a day, but if there was a day that was as good as another, that would be the day Luther, Martin Luther, nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And so uh, it is written, went to several Reformation sites and came home with nine programs that will be aired on 3ABN the last nine nights of October. Uh, you're going to be blessed by these. These are an in-depth look at the Reformation, what brought about the Reformation, what happened, why it matters, and how it applies to us today. And so we looked at the reasons for the Reformation. We examined this church that had become what it should not have become gives us the opportunity to speak rather plainly about some very important teachings of the Bible. We examine the lives of people like Martin Luther, the lives of people like Ignatius of Loyola. You know, he's the man who went to the Pope and said, let us begin an order dedicated to countering the Reformation. So we have a whole hour dealing with Ignatius of Loyola. Who found, what was the order that he founded? Can you tell me? That's it. We call it the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. 
tell you some interesting things. I wish, oh boy, I, I shouldn't start this because I'll never stop. Okay, so, so, so across the weekend, I'll give you the opportunity, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to tell you about some fascinating statues we looked at and some interesting things we saw that send a very clear message to Protestants living in earth's last days. And when we talk about Protestants, you and I both know that Protestants are increasingly hard to find. Because as Luther protested 500 years ago, today most people have stopped protesting. In fact, most people who would be Protestants or Protestants haven't a clue what the protest was even about. So these nine programs, the last nine nights of October on 3ABN, will be programs that you'll be blessed by. The series is called 500, brought to you by It Is Written, and you'll be really blessed. Amen. Well, now, I must put an end to that. Perhaps uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, I'll tell you a little more about some of what we saw and experienced and why it matters so much. Camp meeting theme this year, sacrifice, his and ours. His and ours. We began talking about that last night. Uh, let's pray now and anticipate the blessing of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And it's now the Sabbath where we are. And we are thankful. We just are. Because in your mercy, you, you did more than just give us an hour more than give us a morning. You, you carved a day out of the rock of time and said, every moment that you spend in this day, I want you to be cognizant of where you came from. I want you to remember your roots. I want you to remember that if you go all the way up your family tree, you're going to get to Adam who was made by me. We are thankful that we are your children and that this day is a memorial not only of creation but of Recreation. And so bless us in these hours. Now, as we open your word, we ask you, Father, to speak that we would be blessed according to your will. We thank you and we love you and we pray gratefully in Jesus' name. Please say it with me. Amen. amen. And amen. It was June the 22nd. It was 1746. An expedition of 11,000 men on board 64 ships left France for a place called Annapolis Royal. And if you were looking for Annapolis Royal on a map, and let's say you found it, <laughs> you would see that it is almost directly across the Bay of Fundy. You know where we are? Anybody? All right, no, somebody said New Zealand. God bless you. I mean, no, God bless you. It was not New Zealand, but that's, I mean, that's better than the right answer. <laughs> sure. Annapolis Royal is pretty much directly across the Bay of Fundy from St. John's, New Brunswick. Have I helped? That's where? All right. I know about nine of you know it's Canada. It's just across the Bay of Fundy from New Brunswick in Canada. Back then, Annapolis Royal was known as Port Royal. It was established in 1605 by the French in what was then Acadia, but today is known as Nova Scotia. And this is why the French fleet was on its way to Annapolis Royal. It had been attacked repeatedly by the British and by New England colonists. Eventually, it fell to the British. The French said, mm -mm, we want it back. And so we are going to take it back by force. Think now, this was a force. 11,000 men, 64 ships, they believed the land was rightfully theirs, and they were going to come up against the very best that a small settlement could do. It was not going to be pretty at all. Except that sometimes 
The plans of human beings don't track with the plans of God. And so this is what happened. The French fleet got away late. A storm broke out. Bad winds slowed them down. They became becalmed off the Azores. Disease broke out, not only scurvy, but typhoid as well, back then before antibiotics. Another storm arose during which lightning struck the ships. One of those lightning flashes caused an explosion that killed 30 men. This was tough sailing. There was more bad weather. More ships were damaged, and so the French fleet turned around. They sailed back to France. One of them got a little too close to Ireland for the liking of some. That ship was captured by the British 70 miles off the Irish coast. So by the time this expedition made it back to Nova Scotia, hundreds of men had died and hundreds more were dreadfully ill. The leader of the expedition died six days after arriving. His replacement as leader attempted suicide shortly after that. The whole leader ended in abject failure. Now, what's less known is that in 1746, the people of New England began preparing for this invasion as the French fleet were planning to, on their way to Nova Scotia, sack Boston. That's what they were going to do. And one historian wrote this, so let me read these words to you. The governor, that's the governor of Massachusetts, William Shirley, had proclaimed, listen to what the governor did. Can you imagine a governor doing this today? The governor had proclaimed a fast day to pray for deliverance from this present peril. Everywhere, men observed it, thronging to the churches. In Boston, the Reverend Thomas Prince from the high pulpit of the Old South Meeting House prayed before hundreds. The morning was clear and calm. People had walked to church through sunshine. Deliver us from our enemy, the minister implored. Send thy tempest, Lord, upon the waters to the eastward. Raise thy right hand. Scatter the ships of our tormentors and drive them hence. Sink their proud frigates beneath the power of thy wind. He was just finished praying when the sun suddenly was gone and the morning darkened. A shadow came over the entire church. A wind shrieked around the walls of the building. It was sudden. It was, it was violent, like a, a hammer hammering at those dark shadows with a giant hand. There was nobody up in the steeple. Later on, people swore there was nobody there. In spite of that, the great church bell struck twice. It was described as being a wild, uneven sound. Thomas Prince paused in his prayer, both arms raised. We hear thy voice, O Lord, he called. We hear it, he thundered triumphantly. Thy breath is upon the waters to the eastward, even upon the deep. Thy bell tolls for the death of your enemies. You see, here's what we learn from this story. We learn that when there are challenges, and when our plans don't look like they're working out, when your intentions meet with frustration, delay, even defeat, God's plans no, no defeat. God triumphs always. I wonder if you would turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 26. We will go to that afternoon. That afternoon, Matthew chapter 26. As a matter of fact, it's not the afternoon, now it's the evening. The evening before the afternoon. We'll get to the afternoon sooner enough, soon enough. 
But first, it's evening time. It's Thursday evening before Friday afternoon. And Jesus knew what was coming. He had already said, one of you here is going to betray me. Oh, not I. Oh, not I. It couldn't be me. What could he possibly mean? Isn't it fascinating that the disciples often were told the plainest things by Jesus and didn't understand what he meant? I'm going down to Jerusalem. They're going to they're gonna kill me. And the disciples turned to each other and stroked their chins, and they said, well, what do you think he could possibly mean by that? <laughs> How is that? Add to that the fact, and it is a fact, that the prophecies that they read made clear that Messiah would die. I tell you what it does. It didn't make me doubt, but it causes me to be a little humble about the things that I believe in as much as I wonder sometimes what I could be missing. Huh? Eyes wide open, reading my Bible, studying the Word of God. You got to wonder what you're missing. The disciples were missing certain things, even though Jesus spoke them plainly in, his, in their hearing. And so Jesus had read the Scriptures. He'd read Isaiah chapter 53. We looked at a little bit of it last night. He knew what was coming. Jesus had read the 22nd Psalm, which begins with the words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He'd read that. And he read that and looked at those words and knew that's me David was writing about. Imagine that. He read in Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. He read that. He knew what was coming. Jesus had read where the prophet had written, they cast lots for my garment. He had read Isaiah chapter 53, knowing that he would be numbered with the transgressors. To be nailed between two thieves did not take him by surprise. And so looking forward to... A dark ending of his life, Jesus went out to pray. This is Matthew chapter 26 now. And we must begin reading in verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and he prayed. Now, 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 just stop here. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what Friday afternoon would bring. He'd read it in the prophecies. He knew that. He knew that he would die on an old rugged cross. He knew that. What? Could he have done to prepare himself for Friday afternoon? He could have called every angel in heaven down. He could have done that. He could have raised up an army. He could have armed his followers and fought off his captors. I don't know that his little band of disciples could have defeated the Roman authorities, but it wasn't really the Roman authorities that were giving him grief. I don't know if he could have fought off all of the Jews, but he could have held them up long enough to escape. They could have run. What could Jesus have done Friday afternoon when trouble came? What could Jesus have done when they placed a cross on his back and told him to carry it to Golgotha? What could Jesus have done? He could have called angels, could have raised up an army, but instead, Thursday night, Jesus got ready for Friday afternoon. Verse 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And then he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is what Jesus did to prepare for Friday afternoon. He surrendered his future to his father. He placed his life into the hands of Almighty God. His life was on the line. His very existence hung in the balance. He knew what was going to happen. He wouldn't fight back. What he did was he surrendered himself to God. And he said, God, you fight this battle. 
You do what you will. He didn't pray for darkness. God sent darkness. He didn't pray for Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. At least not, not as far as we know. God sent Simon. He said, I will fight this on your terms. You decide. Not my will, but your will be done. He came to his disciples. They were asleep. He said to Peter, what? Couldn't you wait with me for an hour? Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the what? Tell me. All right. And so he went away and he prayed the second time. He said, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. And then what did he say? Thy will be done. The test of his life, literally. Then Jesus met it by saying, your will be done. He went to the cross Friday afternoon, strengthened because he had given his life, he had given his future, he had committed his destiny to his heavenly Father. Spirit of God, you take over. Not my will, your will. Let's do what you want here. This wasn't all. He came again, found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. He left them. He left them, verse 44, and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Not what I will, but what? Tell me now. Thy will. You know why this is so important for us? The test that we go through isn't going to be the same as the test Jesus went through. I don't even want to put it into that category. Jesus bore the sins of the world altogether different. Altogether different, but very similar. Inasmuch as before Jesus comes back, those faithful ones who are alive and still tread this mortal coil will be in, uh, will encounter the test of their lives. The Bible says that we are coming face to face one day soon with a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Significant time. And you can't prepare for this by working out in the gym. You can't prepare for this by any type of training. This isn't a fitness thing. You prepare for this by praying as Jesus prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Not thy will then, but thy will now. Now and later and in the morning and at lunchtime tomorrow and through the afternoon and tomorrow night and forever. If you want to be prepared for your Friday afternoon experience, it's a matter of not my will, but thy will. This is what prepared Jesus. Now, of course, I'm not minimizing the fact that Jesus was inseparably close to his father and that he spent nights in prayer and he lived his life as one serving others. I'm not forgetting all that. But when push came to shove, Jesus was ready for what Friday afternoon brought him because he prayed to his father and he said, not my will, but your will be done. You know, friends, I wonder if we're having that experience now. We talk about, it. oh, when that time of trouble comes, I'll just let God, hey, but why are you sitting in my seat? Get out of my seat. When the time of trouble comes, <laughs> when the time of trouble comes, I will be, bah, bah, idiot. Get off the road when the time of trouble comes. Are you missing something? Time of trouble came when that, when that driver uh, uh, slowed down in front of you. I mean, I'm not calling it a time of trouble, but you, you, you know why God allows these trials to come into your life? So you can see what's in your heart. That's why. And so when a driver slows down in front of you or somebody at work is snippy at you or your spouse gives you the cold shoulder, whatever it might be. Just wait and see how you react. And that's God saying to you, see what's in your heart. Because God wants you to be ready for Friday afternoon. And this is why we are to say, not my will, but thy will be done. You invest in a stock market and things take a turn for the worse and you lose your shirt. Well, what are you going to do? Lose your Christian experience as well? Or can you say, not my will, but thy will be done? God is still God even when things go bad. God is still God even when the bottom drops out of your world. Listen, Friday afternoon is coming for us, not in the form of a, a real cross, but maybe in the form of that figurative cross that Jesus said we are to take up and carry and follow him if we are truly to be his disciples. Jesus prayed in preparation for the greatest test of his existence. Not my will, but thy will be done. What's your prayer? You see, Jesus could have walked in there and wiped them out, struck them down. But he knew this battle, 
this encounter with the cross was not a battle that he would fight except as he continued to yield his heart to God and allowed God to lead and guide and provide and strengthen. He was on a mission. Jesus' mission, he said, was to do the will of his Father. That's all it was. If it was the Father's will for him to go to the cross, he would go to the cross and say, not my will, your will be done. His life was not the outworking of his own will. His life was the outworking of the will of Almighty God. And so he knew that if his father was leading him to have a nail driven through his wrist, all he needed to do, if that was the will of God in that moment, was say, not my will, your will be done. And if this is your will, bring it on. When they came at him with a hammer and a great big nail to drive it through his feet, nobody wants that. But Jesus said, not my will, your will be done. Where was God's, where was Christ's strength in that moment? Strength was in his Father. Strength was in the power of his Holy Spirit. He hung on by faith to the providence of God, knowing that his Father loved him, knowing that his trial did not represent the rejection or the neglect of Almighty God. He hung on to his Father, knowing that if the cross was God's will for him then, then the will and the grace of God would strengthen him to be able to endure that experience. It says in, in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall do what? Hold your peace. God will fight for you. God will strengthen you. If it is God's will that has led you to a place, if God's providence has allowed a certain circumstance then you can know that God is with you. He will strengthen you, and according to his will, he will deliver you. It is God's business what happens to us. Yeah. Ours is to pray that surrendered prayer that says, not my will, but your will be done. Gideon was called by God to lead God's people to victory and success. He called up an army, thousands. God said, too many. Oh, really? Too many. Still too many. You can't be serious. And he ended up with how many? 300. 300. Humanly speaking, not possible. Humanly speaking, not sensible. Nobody with 300 men goes to fight an overwhelming army. That's folly. Except Gideon didn't argue. Gideon didn't say, hold on, not your will, my will be done. Gideon did not say, I don't see how this can happen. Gideon simply said, all right, if that's what you want, let's go. And Gideon and 300 wrought deliverance for Israel. You know the people who I think were people of great faith? We read, we, we, we read about the, the battle of Jericho, you know. And so there they are, walking around Jericho. I don't know, I wasn't there, but the leaders were leading. The people who I think were people of real faith were the everyday soldiers. Why are we doing this? Well... Because Joshua said it's a good idea. <laughs> and what's going to happen? Well, evidently, God is going to bring deliverance. Deliverance. And, and how's this deliverance going to come about? Well, we just walk. <laughs> All right? How long do we walk for? Evidently, we have to do this every day for seven days. Okay, a lot of walking. It's going to bring us deliverance. Uh, weapons? No, no one said anything about weapons, not initially. All right, we're just going to walk. Yes. Anything else? Yep. What? You're not going to believe me. I'm not going to tell you. Tell me. No, no. <laughs> you sound like a skeptic. I'm not telling you. Evidently, you know something I need to know. What is it? Well, we're going to walk, and then ultimately, we're going to shout. <laughs> we're going to shout? What? We're going to shout, fire! And then they're going to blast the place with cannons? No, no. We're just going to shout, and then the walls are going to come down. You know, what, you know what I imagine? I imagine this long column of people walking, and these two guys having a conversation, and the second one's stopping, and they all just kind of walk in and bump into each other like that. <laughs> boom, boom. It's just what I imagine. hope you don't mind me imagining that, but that's what I imagine. Hold on. We're going to shout. And you said, you said, what? No, no, really, the walls are going to fall down. 
You know, I'll be honest, I have wondered about Joshua. I reckon he's lost his marbles. And the first guy says, no, just trust him. Has he ever led us astray yet? Oh, no. And Moses reckons he's the man. All right. Blessing of God seems to be upon him. I think those poor fellows walking around Jericho were the people of great faith. Joshua got it straight from God. He was convinced. They had to believe him. And somehow they were convinced that if they walked and if they shouted, the great walls of a great city would just come falling on down and then deliverance would be theirs. How could that happen? Because the battle was not theirs, but it was God's. Amen. Come on now, I've got a question for you. Who's fighting your battles? Who? Who's fighting your battles? God fought the battle at Jericho. It was God. Remember that story. Here's what I would like you to do. Dig ditches. <laughs> you want us to do what? No, really. Trust me, God says. Dig ditches. Hello. Oh, so they dug ditches, and when the folks came over the hill, they saw those things. Oh, blood. Oh, my goodness. How does that happen? How about this other time? When there's a famine in Samaria, 2 Kings 6 bleeds into chapter 7. There's a famine. The Syrian army have got them surrounded. Remember that? So much so that they were spending a king's ransom on food that wasn't even food. They would buy a donkey's head. A donkey is an unclean animal. They were buying that for like 80 pieces of silver. They would buy the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung. I don't even know how much that is. Not much. They were buying bird manure. What for? Not to put in their garden, man. This was food. These people were desperate. Desperate. The lepers outside came to their senses. They said, what are we doing waiting out here? There's no food in there for them to give us anyhow. Let's go out to the Syrians. They'll probably kill us, but we're going to die anyway. Let's give it a shot. Off they went. Do you know what God did? Do you know? God sent a noise. The Syrians heard the noise and said, Oh my goodness, mercenaries, let's go. And they ran. They left the food, they left their valuables, they left their gold and silver, they, they left clothing, they left their tents. They just hightailed it out of there. Another time, king was coming against, a heathen was coming against God's people. It was over. What do we do now? That king got word from another part of his kingdom. There's trouble. We got to get out of here. And suddenly they were delivered. Time and time and time and time again, God's people were delivered without even firing a shot. Because... God fought their battles. He was taking care of them. I'm not suggesting we live in some kind of a fantasy world where hardships don't come and we don't have real battles to fight. But when we fight them, who's fighting your battles? If you are fighting your battles, you're going to lose. If God is fighting your battles, you cannot lose, even if it looks like defeat. Jesus said to some fellows in the boat, let's go to the other side of the lake. Halfway across, you know, the wind is blowing, the Rain is coming down. There's water getting in the boat. They're bailing out to save their lives. And Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. They wake him up. Don't you care that we're about to die? One gospel writer said that they were in jeopardy. I just love the language. Sure, they were in jeopardy, all right? Jesus, we're in jeopardy. What are you going to do? He said, oh, ye of... Doesn't that seem a little strange to you? You have a little faith. Jesus, you'd be, you'd be drowning right now if it wasn't for us. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. What do you get off calling us ye of little faith? You've been sleeping. We've been toiling. But they were forgetting the battle was not theirs, it was the Lord's. Jesus had said, let us go to the it wouldn't have matter if Hurricane Irma had been bearing down on them. They were going to make it to the other side of the lake because Jesus had said, we are going to the other side of the lake, plain and simple. And you're halfway to the other side of the, you know, you know come on now, come on now. Some of you, some, 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 some of us, some people look around the church, they go, oh, I'm so discouraged by what I see. I'm so discouraged because not everybody is as holy as I am. I'm so discouraged because I see some churches doing stuff that I don't like. 
I see some church members doing things that I don't like. I'm not suggesting to you that, that, that everything is well. I'm not suggesting that. But I, but, but I remember reading in the Bible where it says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. I remember reading that. I remember reading that God would have a remnant down the last days of earth's history. So while you may weep and cry or sigh and cry for the abominations that you see done, all right, but what are you forgetting? You're forgetting that the battle is not yours. It's God's. It's His church, not yours, never will be yours. It's His. He can take care of it. He can use it. He can purify it. He can work with it. Don't spit your pacifier out like a child in a stroller. Get pouty because you don't like stuff. Not your church. God's church. It's still the apple of his eye. He says, weak and enfeebled though it is, and in need of reproof and correction, it is still the one object upon this earth upon which Christ bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. Hallelujah. It's his church. He'll fight the battles. He'll win the battles. You don't have to be able to figure it out. You don't have to be able to see why. You say, wow, it's uncomfortable in here. There's too much water in the boat. He has said the church is going through. Hallelujah, it's going through. Amen. Feels like a roller coaster for some of God's saints sometimes. You, know you know the people who get hurt on roller coasters? You know who they are? Folks who jump off. They're the ones who get hurt. Don't jump. Don't jump. Man, I don't like those rides. I, I hate them. You know what? I was, in a, I, was in a, in a, I was so blessed. A friend took me for a flight in a, in a private plane not long ago in, in, in Alaska. It was, it was beautiful. And so we took off on a runway. And, uh, and it, was, it was like where folks were camping, you know. And so there was a bunch of people watching and waving. And uh, he took off. And uh, I should have known. I didn't anticipate this. He turned to me and said, do you get air sick? <laughs> Why is he asking me this? I did, I, but I did think that's very considerate. I said, no, I don't, get, I don't get air sick. You can't hear people on board planes, those things. Yeah. I told him, no, I don't get air sick. I don't have a problem with that. He said, good. <laughs> he turned the plane around. Came back along the runway about, I don't know, 50 feet off the ground. Vroom, did this little fly past for the boys. I thought, that's nice. And then you know what he did? Boom, straight up. <laughs> oh, my heart was in my mouth. I closed my eyes. I tensed up. I hoped, I hoped he wasn't looking at me. <laughs> what option did I have then? I could jump out or I could hang on and trust that the pilot knew what he was doing. Let me tell you what I did. I hung on and the good news was pilot knew what he was doing. Hallelujah. Made it safely down. Amen. Who's fighting your battles? Come on now. I want to look at a passage of scripture with you. In fact, I want to look at two. So I need to speed up here. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Let's go there. This is a fantastic chapter. Second Chronicles chapter 20, I'll start in verse, mm, verse 1. It came to pass after this. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. If you're not there, you'll catch up. It's okay. Verse 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. It was not good for Jehoshaphat. Someone came and told them, they said, There cometh a great multitude against you from beyond the sea on this side Syria. Behold, they be on Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. Jehoshaphat feared. And here's what he did. He set himself to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together. They came together. Jehoshaphat stood in a congregation. Verse 6. Here's what he said. Now, you watch. Jehoshaphat's going down. There's no way he can win this. So watch what he prays. 
He says, O oh, oh, oh Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? Do you like that? Aren't you God? That would just about be enough. The inference is, if you're God, we're going to be okay. If you're not, then we're not. Aren't you God? Don't you rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? In your hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? That's what he says. Verse 7, listen to this. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and you gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwelt there, and they built the sanctuary, and so on. Aren't you God? Aren't we your people? You know what he's doing? He's, he's upping the ante in this prayer with God. He's leveraging certain truths, and he's bringing them to God. He is sharing with God what certain realities were. In a certain sense, he's painting God into a corner. Now, I, I know you can't do that, but, but you know what I mean. He's putting this all on God. Aren't you God? Aren't we your people? Didn't you drive these people out? Now, look in verse 10. you got to love this. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Now, did you get what he said? These are the rascals that we were going to kill, except you told us not to. And now they come to kill us. In other words, this is your fault. <laughs> if only we'd killed them like we wanted, we wouldn't be having this problem now. See what you've done? We keep reading. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither do we know what to do. Listen, but our eyes are upon thee. Who's fighting your battles? Friday afternoon is coming. Who's fighting your battles? Jehoshaphat knew who would fight theirs. They got together, the, 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 the mighty men, the, the children, the wives. They all got together. And then the prophet said, Don't be afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, verse 15. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Who's fighting your battle, Jehoshaphat? And you know what happened here? You know what happened here? In fact, we need to read it. It's just magnificent. In verse 22, it says, And when they began to sing and praise. So here's what I'm wanting to see. I'm wanting to see God's people get disagreed with and then sing and pray or sing and praise in response. When someone insults you, go ahead, sing and praise. These aren't Bible stories, man. These are prescriptions. When the board meeting vote looks like it's going south and you're about to lose your experience, sing and praise. Their existence was on the line. And when they began to sing and praise, then... The Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah. And they were smitten. You know what? I'm not trying to rewrite the Bible here, but I am imagining with you that if they did not sing and praise, this may not have happened. Because God said, get the singers out. Get the praisers out. Come on now, sing and praise. The children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, Everyone helped to destroy another. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm not rejoicing in the bloodshed. I'm rejoicing in the deliverance. They turned on themselves. What? How does that happen? God moved. Who was fighting their battle? God was fighting their battle. Who's fighting your battles? Thursday night, Jesus on his knees crying out to God, not my will, your will be done. Sins of the world are starting to press down upon him. It starts to sweat blood. Diapetesis, they call it. Not my, I don't want that, Jesus said. I already told you, if it's possible, let it pass from me. But if this is the road I ought to walk, I'm going to walk it. You will give me strength. Who's, who's, fighting? who's fighting your battles? There's another passage. I'm going to leave Second Chronicles and go to another passage with you. This is Martin Luther's book. Romans. And Romans chapter 7. Let's look at this. Who's fighting your battles? 
Because we, 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 we can talk in generalities and we can talk about the big picture, but let's zero it down now and see if we can get ourselves in the frame, each of us. Romans chapter 7. And I want to start reading in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul says, I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. What I would, that I do not. What I hate, that I do. He says, if I do that, that I would not, I consent to the law that it's good. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I know that in me, in my flesh, dwells no good things. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, uh, I, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. You know, the, the funniest thing about this is there are some people, instead of learning from it, they want to argue about whether this is the converted Paul or the unconverted Paul. There are some ninnies around. You know, Paul said, I. He didn't say, let's park this, put it in reverse and back up 20 years. But you say, you say well, it has to be the unconverted Paul here because the converted Paul wouldn't say this. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you converted? Your answer is yes. Your answer is yes. Are you converted? Your answer is yes. So, are you converted? Yes. All right, yes. Have you ever had a battle like this? Okay, so you were unconverted all of a sudden? Are we saying that only unconverted people struggle? Paul is talking, it doesn't matter, converted or unconverted. He's talking about anybody who is letting their grip on God loosen and is ceasing to find the strength in Christ that he makes available and is starting to shift their focus off where it ought to be. Because suddenly, when you let your grip of Jesus go, you start to drift and you don't have the power to do what you know you should or not do that which you know you should not do. So let's zero in on this here. Now, I, if I do that which I would not, verse 20, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find a law then that when I would do good, evil is present with me. What, how frustrating is this? You want to do the right thing, but... Maybe your, your, your prayer life has, has slackened the last couple of days or your, your blood sugar is low or, or there's some real difficult situations at work or at home or the children are giving you grief or your, your parents, are, somebody is giving you grief. And now you're not thinking straight and your faith slips a little bit. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, I go to church, I tithe, I pray, I, I think I eat well, I exercise. Okay, I, okay, I lie too, evidently. Uh, I, uh, I do all these things that good Christians are meant to do, but right now I'm struggling. There's this temptation, and I want to go right, but I, I can hardly go right. I don't want to go that way, but I'm getting drawn that way. It's really against my will, but... Ultimately, it's not because it's all a matter of the will. What do I do? You ever had that experience? Yes. Oh, yes, you have. Oh, yes, you have. And you cry out to God. You say, God, I've been in church 40 years. I'm still selfish. I've still got a dirty mind. Raised in a Christian home. I still lie. Or whatever it might be. You, you, you've, you're capable of writing in that gap. And then you cry out like Paul cries out in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched woman that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There's a question. Paul said, I mean, I can't do it. I'm in a battle. It's a war. I cannot win. She says these things. Ah, I just, I just strike back. You know, I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. Uh, I'm surfing and I see a link to a website. I know, I know I shouldn't. Ah, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? And then Paul, right, he doesn't leave us hanging. He gives us the answer right here in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind I serve the law of God, with the flesh the law of sin. But he's thankful now. He says it's a body of death. 
I'm just, I'm drawn this way in and of myself. I cannot win the battle. Who's fighting your battles? Paul said, when I fight my battles, I cannot win. But when God is fighting my battles, victory. And then the next verse is one of the most profound phrases in the history of literature. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How do you walk after the Spirit? By praying the prayer that says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Lead me in the way everlasting. Not what I want. It's what you want. That's how you walk in the Spirit. By saying, I'd rather not go to the cross. And you know God calls us to go to the cross every day. Every day. Paul said, I die daily. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. We don't want to be crucified. Who wants that? But we pray the prayer Jesus prayed. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And how do you feel about that? There is therefore now no condemnation. God could have condemned you 10,000 times already. But when you yield your life to Jesus, there's no, con no condemnation. No condemnation. Help me find better news. You can't. There's no condemnation. Who's fighting your battles? Who? Let God fight your battle. Let God fight your battle. What's, what's your battle now? What's your battle? Think of what your battle is. Give it to God and say, God, fight this battle. God, fight this battle. Come on, let's pray now. Father in heaven, our hearts are yours. They are. Uh, we act a lot of the time as though they're not, but they are. Our hearts are yours, so keep them. If the battle is not ours but yours, then fight our battle. Fight that battle. Don't let us lose. We lean on you. We trust in you. We love you. You must do this for us because we can't do it ourselves. We thank you tonight. And we pray gratefully in Jesus' name. Come on, let's say together. Amen, amen and amen. God bless you.